summer morning. I hope you're here to worship. I hope you're here to bow down and just say with us together, you are my God. Let's just say that. You are my God. Is he altogether worthy of our worship? Is he altogether worthy of our worship? Amen. Yes, he is. So we're going to uh, stand right now. We're going to sing a little bit together. Want to stand with me? We're going to sing, Here I am, Lord. I'm here to worship.
Well, good morning. Good to see each and every one of you today. What a great way to express uh, not simply just our need, but the worth of our Lord in, in our lives. You are my all in all. There's a sermon in there somewhere. It's certainly a beautiful, beautiful song. We uh, hope you've had a great week. Uh, we've had a great week. Thank you for allowing us to go on our little outing uh, for our anniversary. And, and um, I was asked, well, how did, your, how did your time off go? I was like, well, we rode these motor scooters through Lancaster and uh, we uh, the Daniel thing at Sight and Sound was just awesome. It was great. And they said, well, how was your anniversary? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> That was great, too. Um, thankful for my wife of 30, 33 years. years. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, praise the Lord. We're good to be back. And uh, just a few things to be reminded of in your bulletin. Uh, please remember we have three sign-up sheets for some uh, important things. Um, if you're interested in church membership, um, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer on the table out there. Uh, a couple have expressed interest in that. Just make sure your name is on that. Also, um, we'd like to invite you if you're interested, and in, there's a lot of uh, new life in our church. If you're uh, interested in rededicating uh, your baby, or maybe not so much a baby, but a child that you've really not dedicated to the Lord before, I would like to schedule something like that, so please sign up for that if you're interested. That is on the table in the foyer as well. And our bike clinic is coming up in our outreach uh, July the 20th at the Sacred Town Yard Sale. And well, look at that. Look at that. Wow. Beautiful babies and some beautiful ladies there. Um, so our bicycle clinic July the 20th, uh, that's a big day for out, of outreach for us for the summer. And uh, be in prayer about that. We still don't have the location nailed down yet. So um, there's some uh, uncertainty about the location, but be in prayer about that um, if you would. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in maybe uh, heading up a children's activity or a children's game or something like that, during the bike clinic, because the bike clinic goes from like 9 o'clock to 1 or 2 o'clock, and we have snow cones and things like that. But we were hoping to maybe uh, sort of institute something a little more ongoing for the kids to come by and have fun. We can minister in that way and talk to parents and things like that. So if you're interested in heading up something, that means you head it up. That means you plan it, you oversee it, you get helpers. But if you're interested in doing that, sign up on that sheet also in the foyer. And we'll certainly help you through that if you have an idea or want to do that. But uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be the 20th of July, and we encourage you to think about that, pray about maybe some way you might be more involved in that uh, for our outreach on that day. And on the 13th, the Neelands, the Neelands are going to be here at the church again for the third time or fourth time. I'm not sure, but uh, we're excited about them being back. Um, that's going to be the 13th, so please put that on your calendar. Uh, again, the yard sale and the bike clinic is July the 20th. And as I understand it, June, June the 29th, our women are going to have their Sisters of Encouragement slash Care and Outreach meeting um, here at the church. So, ladies, be aware of that. It's going to be the one in July because there's so much going on in July. All right. Yeah, so there will be no meeting in July. All right, very good. Very good. Is that everything? Speak now. I'd like you to stand with me. I'd like to read a passage of scripture as we continue in our time of worship. And we'll go into prayer in just a moment. But this is from Romans uh, chapter 8. If you read through Romans chapter 8, that's one of those chapters that has, you know, about every verse in that we quote outside of the context of it all the time. Uh, but this is from Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 31. I'm sorry, 24. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. 
For why does one also hope in what the one sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perfect perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes. For whom he knew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, in whom he predestined those he also called, in whom he called these he also justified, in whom he justified these he also glorified. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, yes, who can be against us? Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' morning. Uh, Jesus name this morning and we're thinking Lord if, 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 if God is for us who can be against us <laughs> Lord if you're involved in our lives what worries should we have what questions should we have but Lord we trust and we believe Lord that you are active and involved in our lives in every situation we believe that you are ruling and reigning over all creation which includes every one of our lives and all of our circumstances Lord and we're thankful for how you work. We're thankful for how you teach us. We thank you for how you've strengthened our faith and how you build in us more Christ-like character day by day, circumstance by circumstance, Lord. So we thank you, Lord. We ask you to continue uh, at work at each of ours, in each of our lives. Continue filling us with your grace for every challenge. Lord, we thank you and we love you today. And we are so grateful for the opportunities that we had this week to somehow point others a little bit in your direction. Help us to have more opportunities and to be more clear in the, in the message and the hope that we share with others. In Christ's name, amen. Remain standing if you can. If you can't, that's okay. We understand and you worship God better. Seated, that's okay. We can worship him either way. In this song, I feel like you know, it's worth standing for. Seek ye first the kingdom.
two in your hymn book and sing along as I play. Be fine. Carol's and 
ours, and we got to meet him. Uh, the reason why I say meet is because it's been a long time since we've seen him. So it feels like we just met him. And uh, put a couple good words in about Christ because uh, they need it. And I just uh, praise God, praise God for life and for all those that love him and give to him. And I can't say any more about Christ, but what I'm saying, I mean, there's a, of course, there's a lot to say about him, but he's just wonderful. Amen, he is. We need to pray for our neighbor, Angie. She was in a really bad uh, accident, Angie was, and I guess the, uh, the seatbelt cut her almost clear to her carotid artery if it would have went any further because that was such an impact that it the seatbelt just cut right into her neck and she's really suffering so we pray for Angie your neighbor all right remember Angie in prayer anyone else have anything to share today We can go to prayer then. What a privilege. <clears throat> what a privilege it is to bring our needs before a God who already knows them, but just wants us to ask. And that's what we're going to do today. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Thank you, Jesus, for the promises we have in your word, for your faithfulness to us. Every day of our life, you load us with many wonderful benefits. We thank you for your continued faithfulness. And Lord, today we want to remember the needs of the, the re, and the requests that have come in today. We think of this Angie, who was in this very serious accident and now is suffering from the results of it. We ask, O oh God, that even now while we're praying, you will visit that home and touch Angie and bring her that very special touch that she needs and we'll thank you and we'll give you praise. We thank you, Lord, that you gave the Englishes a safe vacation and they are back with us now having gone many miles, but safely. And we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We ask you to continue to minister to Glenn. You know the back problem that he's dealing with and the pain that he's dealing with. And Lord, we pray that you would minister to that need in a very special way. And Lord, we'll thank you. We continue to bring Amanda before you and ask you to keep your hand on that young life and on this child and Lord will thank you and will give you praise. We want to continue to remember Crystal Hemlock in prayer as she continues not to be able to eat and she's losing weight. Lord, we just pray that you would minister. You know the cause of what's going on in her body. And as the greatest of all physicians, we're trusting you, Lord, and believing you to minister in that situation. Thank you, Lord, for working. Thank you, Lord, for ministering. We want to continue to remember Ford in prayer as he's recovering from his surgery. Just continue to be with him and grant strength and healing speedily in his body. Lord, we want to remember the camps in prayer, all the youth camps that are going on during these summer months. Lord, we pray that there will be many, many, many decisions for Christ among the young people that attend these camps. Draw these youth close to you, we pray, in this very difficult time in which we're living. Minister, we pray, to our young people. Bring strength, and Lord, we'll thank you. We ask you, God, for the wars that are going on with Ukraine and Russia, with Israel and Hamas, you know all about them, Lord, 
And we're so glad that we can just bring it and bring it and place it in your care with the assurance and the confidence that you know every need. Hallelujah. Work, we pray. Minister, you're the one that can cause wars to cease. And we're just trusting you, Lord, to work and to move in a very special way. And on this very special Sunday, we want to thank you for your shed blood, for the work that you did at Calvary for us. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the cleansing that is ours through that precious blood and for your great sacrifice. As we sang this morning, we have no idea what our sins caused you to suffer. But we're so thankful that you willingly laid down your life that we might have eternal life with you. Have your way in the remainder of this service, we pray, and all that is said and done. And we'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for the message, we're going to sing this song together. And I'm going to teach it to you as we go. And sometimes you're going you're gonna to answer and I'm going to call. So every time it's underlined up there, that's your part, okay? And I'm going to teach it as you go. This song is an African-American hymn that's very popular african-american church i love it i love its message and it's a great preparation as we listen to the word of god and if you could just give me a titch more just to help me out order my steps in your word dear Yeah. 
So we've been going through the series, Great Questions for God and Solid Answers from the Bible. And this, uh, these questions stemmed from our uh, recent young adult conference, uh, Equip, and uh, we only answered about four of these questions during that conference, but I thought what a great sermon series for all of us, not just young adults. And uh, this is just in, in the process or order in which... These were in three by five cards, so as I picked them up, I just thought there's, there's a divine order to these. So this, I'm just going, I'm just going to the order that uh, the, the cards it's, um, that I uh, picked up from that. But our focus for the last couple of weeks has been the question: How can I find God's will and direction in decision making for my career searching and in relationship making? Uh, and that is on the back of the, your bulletin there, is that information. And our quick summary answer is what? When we have a question like that, we answer to God, God, how can I find your will for direction, decision making, career searching, and relationship making? What should be, what's the summary? What's the three word summary? Ask God first. Okay, let's, let's do it properly. Ask God first. Ask God first. Ask God first. Ask God first. All right, that's it. Very good. Everybody gets 100 points for that one. So the analogy of God's will is this, for, for this just for as a working definition. The will of God is like a mighty raging river that flows through eternity. It heaps up high mountains and deep, cuts out deep valleys. It carries away great cities and entire forests, cultures, and people along to their eventual destination or to their eventual predestination. Within that mighty river, all of our problems are solved and every question is answered. It is not so essential that we get answers to our questions as it is that we willfully enter into that great river and allow it to take us wherever it wills. So that is a working definition of the will of God for us in this, in this series. So, so far, um, we started uh, last week, I believe it was, in Matthew chapter 7. And there's the A-S-K in that actual Bible passage. Uh, and we're going to review that just briefly. 
But from Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you, or your version may see, say, Ask and you will receive. Um, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks for him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask of him? And we looked at A, ask in this, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, praying to God, asking him the questions, that, that whatever question is, Lord, help me to find your will. How do I find your will? What is your will? What is your purpose? Those types of questions. But also another A for that was what? Anybody remember the other A? Not only asking, but what? Who said that? Ten points from Lois. Affirming, not just asking, Lord, what are you doing? Oh, Lord, where are you taking me? Or, Lord, what about this? What about that? But affirming, Lord, I trust you. No questions, no requests, just, Lord, I am affirming. I, I, I trust you. I am fully assured that you're guiding and you're leading and you have all of this in control. Every question I have, you have an answer to. Every problem I have, you have a resolution to. So we have an affirmation as well. And then the S was seek. Uh, seek God, seek him first. And we went through that uh, last week. So I want to start off today. <clears throat> you know what a statement of faith is, right? You go to our church's website, there's a statement of faith. It's what we believe. It's what we think about what the Bible says about various topics. So I want to encourage you. Do you have a statement of faith? Not so much a doctrinal statement, but a declaration statement. Is there... Is there something that you could write down and you could, you could put before you to keep before you what you believe to be true about God so that when you have a question, Lord, what are you doing? You can think, oh, you know what? I wrote down an answer to that somewhere. So you can go to your declaration of faith. Oh, yeah. God, what are you doing? I'm working out your problems. I forgot about that. Here it is in my declaration of faith. Lord, I, and furthermore, it says, Lord, I trust you. Oh, I remember that. I remember, I remember saying that. I strayed a little bit from that. Lord, I trust you to work out the problems in my life. Boy, I almost forgot about that. I trusted God for that. Maybe I need to renew that trust. So I encourage you to have a statement of faith or a statement of declaration of what you believe to be true about God and how he is at work in your life. Sometimes we, and we've been focusing on this a little bit, sometimes we, um, not that one part of the scripture is more important than another, but sometimes we only emphasize one portion of a scripture than the other. Sometimes we emphasize our questions in prayer more than our affirmation or declaration of trusting God in our prayer. And today I want to say that more important, not necessarily more important, but we fail to emphasize sometimes, um, more important than finding the will of God for our lives, I believe, is learning to trust the character and nature of God and experiencing his faithfulness, which should result in greater trust and a minimization of anxiety. And who knows, maybe it'll minimize our questions also to him. So affirming an assurance of what God is doing and that he is at work. Perhaps at some point we'll begin to grow past. Lord, what are you doing? As being the first thing comes out of our mouth. But maybe, Lord, I trust in you regarding whatever the circumstance or the situation might be. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I know that you've got this in control. Um, Lord, I know that you've got me right on the path of your will for my life. Help me to fall in line with that. 
And likewise, more important, I think, or maybe more emphasized, than the instruction of ask, ask, seek, and knock are the three points of promise regarding those. If you ask, what is the promise that will happen? You will receive. That's the promise. If you seek, what's the promise? You will find. You will find. It will be revealed to you. And in the context of God's will, you seek God's will, you'll find God's will. It's not like God is secretly behind a tree chuckling as we scramble and all frustration trying to find and figure out what God wants for us. If you knock, what's the promise? Shall be open. Shall be open. That door's going to fly open. Some doors may fly closed. That's how God often leads. And more important than resolving our ignorance with knowledge is the growth and trust that comes through experiencing God's faithfulness and answers to our questions and to our prayers. So we are at, uh, we are at K today, I believe. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get to K in the ask, seek, and knock. Uh, but one of our verses for this morning was Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and 34, and we sang that already. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? Everything else. And he's talking about provisions, he's talking about food, he's talking about clothing in the context here. But all these things that we need will be added to us. And I believe that we can insert there, seek God first, seek his kingdom first, and Every answer to our questions, every prayer that needs to be answered, every bit of direction and guidance that we need is going to be there for us. I believe he's promised that. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The things that we believe. I was reading through chapter 23 of Psalms again this week and realized that the Psalms, is, Psalm 23 is not for funerals. Uh, I'm guilty of that. But Psalm 23 is not for funerals or just for funerals. It's actually a declaration of the writer's faith. The declaration, this is what I believe, and I'm writing it down. So it's going to be Psalm 23 one day. Here it is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There, that, that's, a, that's a statement of confidence and assurance. With God as my shepherd, I won't be lacking for any good thing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me, there's our emphasis in this question, he leads me in beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me how many times is that concept referred to in chapter 23 of Psalms? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. This is not really expounding some theological points. It's focusing on God's character as a shepherd, but this is a declaration of David's faith. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy. This is, he begins and ends with this assurance. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then he ends with that same assurance. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A declaration, affirmation of what we believe about God and a declaration of his assurance in God. There's not a question in there that I think. It's all of, this is what I believe to be true about God. This is what I fall back on when I do have difficulties, when questions do arise. And I'm not sure where God's will is, quite frankly, at the moment. I go back to this. And that's my declaration of faith. It reminds me of God is in control. He's the good shepherd. I can trust in him. He has good things in store for me because I'm trusting and following him. It begins and ends 
with assurance. And it speaks at least twice that he leads. The idea is that he has faithfully led. The idea that he is presently faithfully leading. And the assurance that he will continue to faithfully lead. He leads in paths of righteousness. He leads beside still waters. It's the idea that this is just simply what God does. It's his character. It's who he is. We often evaluate whether or not we are in God's will by the outcome of our decisions. You ever do that? Well, I prayed for this and I believe this might be God's will and I stepped out and that door slammed shut in my face. So I guess that wasn't the will of God. Hey, I'd say it probably was the will of God. But God shut the door. But God shut the door. He opens doors. He shuts doors. We think, well, that didn't work out. That was a painful experience. I prayed about this. I made that decision. And, whew, man, I got raked over the coals in that experience. That obviously wasn't the Lord's will. Or I missed God's will. Wrong. That doesn't, that doesn't indicate you've missed God's will. I think we need to be very careful. We don't determine whether or not we are in God's will or not. Or whether or not God answered our, our prayer or not. By the outcome of our situation. The outcome of our situation might be God's will and purpose of testing us. Or disciplining us. Or strengthening us. Through difficulties and even hardships. If our outcome was uncomfortable, inconvenient, stressful, painful, or if we experience some kind of loss and we are often quick to think, I've missed God's will. Maybe we didn't verbalize it, but we thought it. Or I must have made the wrong decision. We assume or we presume all God's answers to our prayers and all the experiences along his perfect path of righteousness for us will be one of pleasure and ease and comfort. How wrong can we be? How wrong can we be? In fact, in verse 23 and verse 4, this is what it says. God is leading and his will may take us through the valley of the shadow of death. That may not necessarily be our own physical death or death of a loved one, but it might be quite likely the death of self. You know, putting ourselves on the altar, let, sacrificing ourselves before God, our own will, saying no to ourselves and yes to God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. In the sense, that's a prayer of putting to death our will and our preference. Not my will, but thy will be done. We know that God's lessons are almost always a bit painful or stressful. And the answers to our prayers, his answer to our prayers are almost never what we expected, right? We should be careful then in evaluating God's will or our own decision making by how pleasant or unpleasant the process or circumstances may be. There is a wonderful song called Blessings by a gal named Laura Story. She sings it. I don't know if she wrote it. But it's one of the most wonderful worship songs, um, sort of a, a song of declaration of what we trust God for, even in hard times. No, I'm not going to sing it this time, but I'm going to read it. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for our families, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing. For prosperity, we pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear each spoken need. Yet love is way too much for you to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know that you're near. And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? 
We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot hear. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise in your word was not enough. All the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to just believe. When friends betray us and when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that we are not home. This is not our home. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights is what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can never satisfy? And what if the trials of this life, the rain, the storm, the hardest of nights, are your mercies in disguise? What a shame to think that difficulties is a sign that we've missed God's will or that God has failed to answer a prayer. I'll have to say, how selfish is that? How selfish is, is that to determine God's care and relationship with us by the outcome of whether or not we're pleased with the circumstances? Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says this, and I encourage you to jot this down. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace at which we now stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Jesus himself prayed in the garden, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Surely, if we mean business with God, and if there is the slightest possibility that we, you, I, are not on track with God's will for us, or that I'm not genuinely seeking his will but my own, then surely we must understand, we must understand that there is a need to refocus and reprioritize our own personal interests and in God's plan for our lives. There may be a need to refocus your life, my life, your priority, your focus, your, mo your motive, and put, take our interests off the throne and put Christ's interests on it. If you're aware that your car isn't running properly, it's missing, running rough, overheating, and there's this noisy clang that won't stop underneath the hood, you take your car to the mechanic, right? Oh, you might try to tug on some of the spark wires or try to rattle and see if everything, anything's loose or anything, but you'll eventually come to the realization that you need to take it to the mechanic and asking him to just look it over. Give him the symptoms and say, here, just do what needs to be done to kind of make things right. Run a diagnostic checkup on my car. Well, maybe we need to ask God to run a diagnostic checkup on our spiritual life. Christians, we must regularly be going to our great mechanic and confessing to him, Lord, I've been praying my will be done, not yours. And it's easy to do. We pray for things that our heart desires. And not everything we pray for is sinful or wrong. 
but God just knows what's best, what's best for us and what will bring him most, the most glory. Maybe we should pray, Lord, would you run a systems check on me, a diagnostic check on my heart. Check my motives, check my desires, check my priorities, check my heart as I'm considering or facing this type of a decision in my life. And when we do that, we have this strong reassurance that the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. Romans 8, 26, we read this earlier. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We know what to pray for what we want, but we don't always know what to pray for as we ought. So the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. For he who searches hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You ever stop to think about that? Not only is Jesus praying and interceding for us, Book of John shares that, but in Romans 8, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is interceding and praying for us according to the will of God. If Jeff misses it, and he often does, then the Holy Spirit's going to get it right. Right? The Holy Spirit prays perfectly according, and I'm reading from Scripture here. I'm not, I'm not saying, you don't have to think about this. The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So Jeff's going down the wrong road, and I'm saying, Lord, bless me with a monster truck. I'd love to, I don't really want one. I'd just love to drive one. I don't really want one. But, but say I was doing that. Lord, bless me with a monster truck. Holy Spirit's there. Forget that one, Father. Lord, give me a beautiful voice. Give me a wonderful voice so I can sing and make people ooh and ah when I sing hymns in church. And the Holy Spirit's like, forget he said that. Forget he prayed that. Those things aren't, those things aren't according to God's will. If it was God's will, he would have given me a good voice for singing. Thankfully, he didn't. Because it would be a big issue of pride for me. So praying according to God's will. We see the Holy Spirit of God faithfully in upholding his responsibilities. And doing for us what only he can do for us. And what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. Searching our hearts. Knowing our thoughts. Aware of our motivation, aware of our personal interests and perspective, searching our hearts, determining our motives, evaluating the wisdom, if any, of our choices and our actions. As we're asking and praying and seeking God's will and allowing his Holy Spirit to search and, 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 and prod and look into and redirect and redirect in a way that would be more pure for us and more honoring for the Lord in our, in our lives. And if God should, through his Holy Spirit, identify something in our hearts that is not aligned with his heart or his purpose, that means we will be faced with a need to repent from going our own direction and doing what we want to do. We will need to give it up. We will need to lay it down at his feet. We'll need to let it go. And don't take it back again. Leave it all behind. I think we need a checklist. This is kind of what I was thinking. If, I, I, if God would just give me a checklist. Jeff, this is the thing. You just check this off every single day and you'll be in good shape. If you... Uh, have this as a checklist for your prayer life. This is this this is this would be helpful if you had a checklist for making God's making directions to determine God's will for your life. That would be helpful. So get your pencil out. 
I'm going to give you a checklist. I'm going to give you a checklist. Number one. As we're asking and seeking and knocking, and this includes the cave of, of uh, ask, seek, and knock, knocking on, knocking on heaven's door, you know, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Can you imagine that if you, if we did that, if you knocked on heaven's door? I got a, I got a, I got a question, I got a decision regarding God's will for my life, or about God's purpose, or some, some big, big event, something I need God's wisdom for. So I'm going knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. And imagine God came and opened that door. And there I am, knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. And God opens the door and says, yes, may I help you? I said, well, God, my name's Jeff. I need some help in making some decisions. He's like, Jeff. Sounds familiar. You look familiar. Did, weren't you here a year or two ago? Seemed like I remember you here once before. Obviously, wouldn't go like that. But in reality, when do we go really go to God for prayer? Too often it's like, well, it's a huge decision. Or boy, am I in trouble. Or there's this event, there's this circumstance. And I don't want that to happen. Lord, would you stop it? Lord, would you do this instead? Here's my plan, Lord. We'd write God out a list or a map, and this is what you need to do. And we go knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. You know what? We should be very familiar to God, right? Our prayer time should be very familiar to God. God should... We should, we should not be praying just once ever so often. Billy Graham says, um, reminds us how important it is in a lot of his writings. Um, always be in prayer. Pray at all times. Somebody interviewed Billy Graham one time. and said, you made this quote from the Bible. You quote that all the time. Um, to encourage us to be in prayer at all times. Be praying. He said, or, he said do you do that? He says, yes, I'm doing it right now. He says, but you're talking to me. He said, well, I'm just in, 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 a, in, a, in a sort of a, a motion of prayer with God right now. You came up, you asked me a question, but I'm still in a, in a prayer uh, concept, prayer relationship with God right now. That's where my mind is, even though I'm, I'm asking you, you're asking me questions, and I'm trying to answer those questions. We should be praying at all times, in all situations, and always asking but affirming. Not always asking but trusting. Here's, here's the checklist of not, not knocking on heaven's door for decision making. Number one, do your research. Now these are, these are practical, not only spiritual, finding, help, asking help from God, but they're kind of practical. Get information and gain knowledge about what you're praying about. What is the issue? Write down those things. Write down as much as you know about what's going on, about this, this thing that you're praying about, this decision that's before you. Get, do your research. Get information. Secondly, evaluate your options. Knock on the door of opportunity. Pray. Seek God's guidance. <clears throat> knock, <clears throat> knock on a couple of doors. See if that door opens. See if that God closes that door. Knock on doors of opportunity. What is presently available? When it comes to jobs, I always taught our sons, you know, you know what? When it comes to employment, take what you can get until you find what you want. Take what you can get until you find what you want. Don't wait for something to fall in. You know, you're 70 years old and never had a job. The right one just never came along. Take what you can get until you can get what you really want. Knock on these doors. What is available at the moment? 
What door of opportunity seems open to you? Lord, is that your will for me? All the time being prayerful. Evaluate it. Is there a moral issue involved? Is anything conflicting with the word of God when I make this decision for one of these choices? Does something conflict with biblical values? Something would honor the Lord or dishonor the Lord? Do your research and evaluate your options. Thirdly, weigh the potential outcomes. Weigh options, pros and cons. Is it biblical? Does it honor God? Practically speaking, what are some potential ramifications if I made that choice? If I took that job in Timbuktu, guess what? You're going to leave your family behind. Things to think about, practical things to think about. Weigh the options. How might this affect my future? How might this affect the future of others? Especially if you're a, the dad or a husband or a single parent making decisions for your family. It's going to affect your children. It's going to be affecting a lot of different things. But weigh the way the potential outcomes, the pros and cons of one decision if going one way or the other. Fourth, ask input from other Christians. Be careful which Christians you ask. But seek input from other Christians. What do other mature, devoted disciples of Jesus have to say about the decision that you're getting ready to make? How do you feel about it? What do they think about it? What wisdom might they be able to share with you regarding making a decision like this? And then, make a decision. Just make a decision. As you're praying, if you feel free to do that, just make a decision. Six, take steps of action towards a particular direction that you're considering. Be open to God opening doors of opportunity, but also closing doors of opportunity. Circumstances, this is, this is, this is my uh, sort of a perspective, Circumstances that are beyond our control may be a good indicator that God is leading you, is doing something uh, to guide you. If it's something that's out of our control, it just may be God at work, closing the door or opening the door. God adjusting your path or redirecting your path. When circumstances make our decisions for us, we should not view that as bad luck or even negative, but that God has either allowed or disallowed that option. I believe that's part of trusting God and part of his faithfulness. Seven, keep in prayer. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking on possible opportunities. In Matthew chapter seven, ask you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be open to you. It's the idea of you keep asking, God will keep answering. You keep seeking, it will continue to be given to you. You keep knocking, God's going to open the door. But it's a continuous thing. Don't just do it once, once a year. Knock on heaven, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. God, you there? It's been a while, but I, mean, I, I need your help again. Remember for that, don't view difficult circumstances stemming from your decisions as meaning that you'd made the wrong decision or that you'd missed God's will. Matthew 7, 14, the gate is narrow and the way is hard. That leads to life. Not that it's necessarily hard to find or that it's hard to get saved. But it's not an easy life, a life following Christ. The fact is, we don't have the whole picture, but God does. Keep on praying, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on trusting God's promises to influence, to guide, and to be faithful to you. I believe this is part of the process. Sometimes it's a nerve-wracking process, but it's part of the process of finding God's will for your life and for decision-making. 
I want to close uh, with this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is. Wow. Wow. There it is. So that you can prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Finding God's will for your life is not a matter of making the right decisions here or there or now and then. So that you seek God here or there or now or then but something we do regularly. We seek God regularly. Remember, we seek God in the smaller things. The bigger things will kind of take care of themselves. The big, big things are a whole lot of little things compiled together. If you need direction and you turn on your GPS, if, you're coming, if your goal is to go to Meadville, Pennsylvania, and you don't have a map, but you're lost, don't know how to get there, and you turn on your GPS system and the gal's name, the voice says, Go a quarter of a mile and take exit 147A. And you, you turn the GPS off? That's all I needed to know. No, that's not the end of the road yet. And you still got a ways to go. Well, you go down here at this light, go over here down that hill, and you go down this way, there's down that direction. There's still more to come. You don't just turn it on, get one blurb, and then turn it off. We don't just knock on heaven's door and say, Lord, help me now. And then just kind of, okay, I'll see in a year or two or the next time a big, a big concerning decision comes to me. Finding God's will and purpose for your life involves a lot more than just getting one or two questions answered or simply arriving at your next destination. God's will for us is more of a daily relationship and an ongoing lifestyle of walking with the Lord and abiding with Him and in, abiding in His Holy Word, allowing Him to lead us day by day in the smaller things, which will eventually result in you experiencing God's will in the bigger things. There is no quick answer. There is no easy answer. But I am convinced the best answer is not just a one-time seeking of God's will only when the big decisions come up. But talking and nurturing that relationship with God every single day. Every single day. Talking to God about the small things, about the medium-sized things, and more in line and you have more of a nurtured relationship or spiritual life when it comes to the bigger things. And I think it's less stressful that way. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, as we think of God's will and your purpose for our lives, Lord, we are thankful for your goodness, Lord. Uh, we're aware of your goodness. Uh, Father, we just pray, oh God, that you would help our hearts to be open and receptive. Lord, help us to be seeking you day by day, not just event by event. Lord, we love you. We want our lives to be honoring to you in every way. And Lord, we do love you and we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>
Is not the bread which we break a sharing of the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we are all partakers of one bread. As we think of the Lord's table and communion, let us think of the celebration of Christ's shed blood, the shed blood of Christ on the cross for the sins of the world. And all believers share in that forgiveness. All believers share in the effect of Christ's blood. But also, communion is a celebration of the body of Jesus Christ. That is, all believers in Christ being forgiven, we are all part of the body of Christ because we have all trusted in him as Savior. And we all have been brought into his family through Christ and Christ alone. One bread, Christ alone, like one way, one truth, one life, one Savior, one forgiveness, one spirit. We have gained salvation through Christ alone, through his shed blood, and through his broken body on the cross. Passover meal with Jesus and his disciples that he took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you as often as you do this do so in remembrance of me we remember your body broken for us your church and we thank you
Passover meal, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. And Lord, we remember your shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins and we thank you. Thank you. 
know that. Yeah. 